So if you haven't caught along already, I'm going to be preaching on John the Baptist. I'm going to go through the life of John the Baptist and uh, point out some things hopefully you didn't know already about John the Baptist. Obviously, John the Baptist is most famous for being a Baptist in the sense that he was sent to baptize people with water. And we'll see him saying that as we go through some of the passages, particularly about him. Now, it's interesting that, see, when, when Zacharias spoke by the Spirit of God and he's saying, hey, they're joyful about this child. Why? Because they knew that there was a prophet coming from the Old Testament that would precede the Savior coming. And because they knew that John the Baptist was that voice crying in the wilderness, was that messenger to prepare the way before the Lord God coming in the flesh, they knew that the Savior was nigh, right? The Savior was here. Um, his ministry was about to start because obviously Mary, um, oh, they knew about John, right? But they knew Mary had given birth to that Savior. So they know that these things that were prophesied will shortly come to pass. But just some things, if you didn't see there in, uh, in uh, Luke. Now, why do I want to talk about John the Baptist? What I think is really interesting about John the Baptist is when Jesus is talking about John the Baptist, he makes this statement in Matthew 11. He says here, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, look at this, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What is he saying here about John the Baptist? He's saying here, of all the men that are born of women, that's all of us, and we're excluding, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, because obviously John the Baptist is not greater than the Lord himself. But when the Lord is saying this, he's, he's obviously comparing him to all other mortal men, right, that are, that are just regularly born of women, not the Lord Jesus Christ. He says here that John the Baptist was actually the greatest man. There's not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Did you know that? Did you know that from the Lord Jesus Christ's perspective, this is Jesus' opinion of John the Baptist. He's saying there's nobody greater than John the Baptist. Now, if John the Baptist is one of the great, is the greatest man that ever lived, greater than Solomon, greater than David. Great, I mean, think about all the people. As you go through the Bible and you go through the Hall of Faith, even in Hebrews 11, think about the great characters that are in the Bible. Well, you know, when Jesus said, hey, who rises above all of them? He said, John the Baptist is the greatest man that has ever, ever, has ever lived. So if that's the case, we should ought to look at John the Baptist's life and see, well, how do we emulate John the Baptist to make sure well, we are trying to strive to live according to the greatest man that ever lived? Now, what does he say here? Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So isn't that interesting that even the greatest man on earth pales in comparison to somebody in the kingdom of heaven, somebody who's saved in the kingdom of heaven with their new body, the least of those people is still greater than John the Baptist, right? So you see, we cannot even attain to the perfection that we are going to get once we get our new bodies. And likewise, John the Baptist, even though he was the greatest man that ever lived in the sinful flesh, he still had the sinful flesh to struggle with, and we will see that. So let's first of all go to Luke 1, the chapter that we just read, and I'll point out a few things if you missed it along the way. So if you miss that story, basically what happens is you have a priest, Zacharias. These, these are the parents of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist's dad was a priest. Now what does that mean? That means Zacharias was of the Levite tribe. But when you're a priest, you are specifically of the lineage of Aaron. Because if you remember, Aaron was appointed as the first priest with Moses. Moses and if you didn't realize, Aaron, because they were um, you know, brothers and Miriam was their sister, they were of the Levite tribe as well. Because if you remember reading in Exodus 1 and 2, um, there was a Levite man married a woman and gave birth to Moses. So they were, of the, they were Levites as well, but uh, Moses was not a priest, right? Because the first priest was Aaron, and those that are of the Aaronic lineage... Those are the ones that are the priests. But the Levite tribe, Gershon, uh, Merari or something, and I can't remember the last one, uh, Kohath or something, these are the three sons of Levi that were the three different sections that worked within the temple. They were different, different uh, roles. So we read about what was um, Zacharias' role in that priest. He was to burn incense. 
you can probably figure out which of the three he was. I can't remember off the top of my head, but each of them were given different roles. One was to work within the temple. One was like to set up the temple and to pull it, uh, set up the tabernacle and pull it down. Um, and they had different tasks there within the Levite tribe. And you can see here his mother also was of the Aaronic lineage, even though they couldn't be priests. Priests were always men. You can see his wife was of the daughters of Aaron. So back then, they, they would marry within their tribe as well. So you can see here, these two parents married within their tribe, but Mary was a cousin, so we, we don't know how that all works, but Mary was a cousin of Elizabeth, uh, but obviously they were of the lineage of Judah, right? Because uh, Jesus Christ had to be of the lineage of, of Judah to, to uh, fulfill prophecy. So we see here that John, that means John the Baptist also was of the lineage of Aaron, if, if, uh, if uh, we know that his parents was of, of the lineage of Aaron. Now, Elizabeth and Zacharias were in the similar situation, if you remember, to Sarah and Abraham. Because you remember, Sarah and Abraham were very old, and Sarah, Sarah was even past the time when she was able to have a child, and they were very old, and, they were, and she was barren. So this is the same situation with Elizabeth and Zacharias. Elizabeth was known to be barren and they were both very old. And this is why even John the Baptist's birth was m miraculous. You know, like Isaac's birth was miraculous. Jesus' birth was miraculous in a different way because a virgin conceived. But John the Baptist also had a miraculous birth in the sense that his parents were really old. Elizabeth was barren. But this is when the angel comes to Zacharias. So if you missed what happened in Luke 1, Zacharias is in the temple doing his incense thing that he does. And we notice in, in, in Luke chapter 1 that that's like a ministration. So it seems like they would go and stay at the temple, that he would do his job, and then the, when his time was up where he did his work, he would go away. So you can see that there's this kind of roster system that they would go and do their time, and then they would go and stay with their family and things like that. And this is what the priests did. So what happens is he's going into the temple and he's doing his incense and then an angel actually approaches him, tells him his wife is actually going to give birth. Now because he doesn't believe the angel, he's struck dumb. What does that mean? He's not able to speak anymore. So he comes out of the temple not speaking and people think, well, he's probably seen something in there. Now he's able to communicate with writing because we can see there at the end of the chapter he's able to communicate the name of the son that Elizabeth gives birth to. So surely now people are starting to learn that, you know, hey, this is why he was struck down. An angel came to him and said he was going to have a son. But it wasn't until it was all fulfilled and he gave the name to his son John that he was able to speak again at the end. Now what else is interesting about John the Baptist? That his name was appointed just as Jesus's was. So his name was given to him just like Jesus' name was given to him. It wasn't just something that was decided by the parents. And you often want, I guess you wonder that if he didn't call John John, would he have would his mouth have loosened? You know, so maybe if he named John something else, he would have stayed dumb. So it seems like you know he named he, he confirmed, no, we're not gonna name him Zacharias after his father. He's, we, he, we're told to name him John. They obeyed that command, and as soon as that command was obeyed and it was fulfilled, his mouth loosed. Now what's interesting about John the Baptist, because it's prophesied in the Old Testament that Elijah would come, and people are expecting Elijah to come before the coming of the Lord. Now there's two ways you can understand John the Baptist. I've always understood it that he came in the spirit of power of Elias. You know, that he just came and, and, and somehow he, like, like uh, Elisha, had a double portion of Elijah's spirit. That was a saying that Eli uh, John the Baptist came and he came in that spirit and that power of Elias, of, of Elijah. But some people actually believe he was Elijah and just didn't know it. You know, so some people believe he was actually Elijah, come back in the spirit. Similar to the way Jesus Christ, his spirit is the spirit of God. Is it possible that John the Baptist had the spirit of Elijah but just didn't know he was Elijah? So even though he's referred to as Elijah in the Old Testament, we're told here in Luke 1 that he came in the spirit and power of Elias, but Jesus himself confirms, hey, this is, he was Elijah, which was for to come. So are we to take Jesus' words that he just came in the spirit and power of Elias, as we learn in Luke chapter 1, or was he actually Elijah even though he didn't know. So two different theories there about John the Baptist. And now if you didn't know, Elizabeth, who was John the Baptist's mom, was Mary's cousin. So you can see that John the Baptist and Jesus were actually very closely related by extended family. If you didn't know that, 
and because Elizabeth, the, the, the angel came to her and then once uh, Zacharias, they left, Elizabeth conceived. Six months later is when uh, Mary is told that she's going to conceive with Jesus. So we can see how old John the Baptist is to Jesus, that he is six months older. And part of this story is, is that Mary, once she finds out she's pregnant, um, she finds out also that her cousin, who is barren, is pregnant. She goes to see her and um, uh, stays with her for those last three months. Now, something that is interesting about John the Baptist, he is actually the first person to acknowledge the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in Mary's womb. So I know I talked about this when we talked about abortion. We can see here that, that is act, there are actually, it's actually a human being inside that womb. And the Bible not only is, you know, teaches us that life begins at conception, but it's interesting that a baby at six months within the womb is the first one to rejoice at the sound of the Lord Jesus Christ's mother, Mary. Right? And the thing is, as soon as she comes in, it says, For lo, as soon as the voice of thy, of thy salutation sounded, Right, she's saying, in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And if you remember, Elizabeth starts saying that the, you know, blessed is the fruit of thy womb. So this is like quite miraculous in the sense that when Mary walked in and just said hello to Elizabeth, Elizabeth filled with the Holy Ghost, her babe, John the Baptist, leaps for joy, and she knows that Mary, that Mary is pregnant. Right? So you, I don't know if you noticed that, that Mary didn't tell her. Right, I was pregnant. As soon as she said hello, Elizabeth from the Holy Ghost, it was revealed that she knew that Mary was pregnant. All right, let's get on to Matthew 3. So that's Luke 1, where we learn about the miraculous birth of John the Baptist. Right? And we see here that he was the first one to acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he leaped in the womb for joy. So what can we learn? Because we're talking about what makes John the Baptist the greatest man to ever live. Now, obviously, we can't all have a miraculous birth, you know, but what we can do, what we can learn from that first story is he acknowledged the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? When he heard about the Lord Jesus Christ, he joyfully received that word. So first of all, if you want to be the greatest man that ever lived, you've got to be saved. Right? So... That's how I can interpret that passage in terms of, hey, how can we apply it to us? Well, first of all, you've got to be joyful at the, uh, at the news of Jesus Christ and receive that word joyfully and be saved. That's the first one we can learn from Luke chapter 1. Let's go into Matthew 3. So Matthew 3 now is when the ministry of John the Baptist is being talked about, how he is pointing people to the Lord Jesus. Now let's learn a few things from Matthew 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now this is where you know, I feel people are always misusing the ministry of John the Baptist, right? And his ministry, where they say he preached repentance and they feel like they, they always use John the Baptist as a reason to preach work salvation. Like he came, he preached repentance and then they go to his teaching and they say, hey, look, he told people to get correct their lives and do these things. Well, what you have to understand that that's not all John the Baptist taught. He didn't only teach about salvation. He taught many other things as well. So where he's teaching here, where he's teaching the baptism of repentance, we don't have to misunderstand John the Baptist's message and wonder what was this message of repentance. Because in Acts 19, Paul clarifies what is the baptism of repentance that John was preaching. Paul says here, then, uh, we're told about Paul here, then says Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So was the message of John the Baptist to repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, to turn away from all your sins and do right in order to get saved? No, the baptism of repentance is that there was somebody coming after him right? There was somebody coming after him that people needed to believe on. That's why he says in John 1, yeah, I was sent to baptize with water, but there cometh one after me, one that's mightier than I, right? He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So that was his preaching of the baptism of the repentance, of why he said, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But this is not all John the Baptist preached. 
Right? John the Baptist didn't just preach the baptism of the repentance. He preached the word of God faithfully. There was many things that he preached. So not only did he preach that, see, for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So this is the, pro the, the prophecy of John the Baptist and how he fulfilled it, who he was. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins and his meat with locusts and wild honey. So this is another thing about John. I mean, he didn't care really how he appeared. He just was dressed. You know, probably people would think about him and think that he was dressed very like a wild man. But I don't know if that's the case. I mean, he's always depicted as somebody that's just like got this shawl over him. He's like a, you know, he's kind of like, you, how you'd picture Nebuchadnezzar when he's in the wild, right? That's how they always picture John the Baptist. Like he's like, Rah! you know, they're going to hear, hear his preaching. I don't think that's the case. You know, I just think he was dressed but because he lived out in the desert, you know, he just had a certain thing that he was wearing. I mean, back then, a lot of people wore mantles and they had belts. So we don't really know. I don't really think he was just this crazy guy. You know, he was just doing his job. He was just a very bold preacher. So I don't think it's right for him to be depicted as crazy rather than bold. Uh, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. So he had a very modest apparel, a very modest um, um, diet as well. Then went out to him, Jerusalem. And all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So first of all, what's one thing he did that was great that we can emulate? One is, well, he preached the gospel, right? One thing that made John the Baptist great is that if you think about who was known to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, that was John the Baptist. You may think, hey, Paul was a great preacher. He went around, you know, and he, he taught a lot of great things. But when you think about who pointed people to Jesus Christ the most, you would think John the Baptist, the one that said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So one, he preached the gospel. Two, look at here. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, does it look like John the Baptist is scared of the religious leaders of his day? Is he trying to be political, politic, politically correct? Is he just trying to get along with everybody for the sake of getting along and putting aside false doctrine? No. He boldly proclaimed the gospel and he also called out the religious leaders in his day and he wasn't scared to rebuke them publicly when they came to his baptism. He says, "O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. So what is he calling out here? The fact that they thought they were fine just because they were physical descendants of Abraham. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. See, it's not special that you are a descendant of Abraham. It says God is able to turn stones into children of Abraham. That's not what makes you special. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water. So here we go. The main reason why John the Baptist is called John the Baptist. Right? He's called the Baptist because he was sent to baptize people. He is the one that started the ordinance of baptism why we dunk people in water and they go under and and come up again this is why it is started it was sent uh it started with john the baptist but he that cometh after me is mightier than i whose shoes i'm not worthy to bear he shall baptize you with the holy ghost and with fire whose hand whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So you see here, first of all, he's pointing people to Jesus. He's preaching the gospel. Secondly, in Matthew 3, he's rebuking the false doctrine and rebuking the religious leaders of the day that are leading people astray, thinking that they are fine just because they are Jews physically rather than Jews spiritually, like we read about in Romans 2, that the true circumcision is circumcision of the heart, not one that is outward, outwardly, like he says in some of his letters, fear not the concision, right? The concision, why does he call them the concision as opposed to the circumcision? Because concision just means you're just cut, you know, like with scission, concision, you're just physically cut. So he's saying, don't just fear the people that are just physically that cut, 
but we, want, we are the true circumcision. We are the ones that are spiritually cut, right? Spiritually circumcised through the circumcision without hands. Third one in Matthew 3. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Now remember, John the Baptist is so humble. He says, the one that comes to me, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. Now think about taking off somebody else's shoes. It's quite a humble act in the sense that somebody, something a servant would do, somebody who's quite lowly would do to somebody else. You know, we think about the Lord Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. John the Baptist knew his place, right? And he said, I'm not even worthy to untie the shoes of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now Jesus comes to him, right? He says, then cometh Jesus from Galilee unto Jordan, to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him so now jesus somebody that john recognized not even worthy to untie his shoe latchet is now submitting to my ministry gosh how humbling is that like to, to him to, to 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 have the lord jesus as part of your ministry that's like jesus choosing a church and he's choosing hey i'm going to make this church my home how humbling would that be or to or how easy would that be for john to be lifted up right to think that jesus is coming to your ministry but no look at what john says john forbade him right he says no saying i have need to be baptized of thee and comest thou to me he's saying oh you have to baptize me why are you coming to me to be baptized and jesus answering said unto him suffer it to be so now for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness then he suffered him so what's number three number three is that John the Baptist was willing to submit to the will of Jesus Christ, even when it didn't feel right. You know, sometimes, we, sometimes we're more righteous than God. You know, like sometimes God wants us to do things, and we're like, oh, no, you know, we, you know, we say like, oh, you know, I won't do that. Or, I, I, you know, like for example, maybe somebody's giving you something. And God wants us to be able to receive things with thanksgiving. He wants to allow people to be a blessing. We're like, oh, you know, no, 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 don't do that. This is kind of like Jesus coming to John. Jesus coming to John, blessing him with something. You know, Jesus submitting himself to John's ministry, giving him this blessing. And what does John do? He turns it away. But then Jesus corrects him. says, no, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. See, John was not more righteous than Jesus to go, no, no, just to keep saying, no, 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 give me this blessing. I'm not. See, now, now it's a false humility. See, humility is when you say, okay, John forbade him, right? Because he knew his place. But when Jesus corrects you, like when you're corrected from God's word, then you do it. Now to continue to say no is now a false humility. Now you're actually pulling yourself above Jesus Christ because you're rejecting what he's telling you to do. But John the Baptist was not like that. Even though he was humble, we see here he had the right response to Jesus Christ. When Jesus even got him to do something he wasn't comfortable with, he still submitted to the will of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So we see here John the Baptist. We remember, we, we're thinking, what makes John the Baptist the greatest man that ever lived? Well, we're looking at his life, seeing the sort of things he did. You know, first of all, acknowledge the Lord Jesus. He's preaching the gospel, pointing people to Jesus. He's preaching the word of God faithfully. He's rebuking people, the religious leaders, with their false doctrine. And he's submitting to the will of God. Right? He's obedient. He's not resisting the will of God, even though it doesn't always make him feel comfortable. Let's go into John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're going to look at John's ministry now before he is cast into prison before he is cast into prison. John chapter 3. Now after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. So we learn a bit later on that even though Jesus here it says he's baptizing, it's not actually Jesus that's baptizing, it's his disciples that are baptizing. So at the same time, while John has a public ministry, at this time, Jesus has not yet, I believe, started his public ministry. He's gathering his disciples. You know, people are starting to hear about him. They're coming to him to get baptized. His ministry is starting to grow even before it starts getting public. John is also baptizing his well, now as well. Now, in the flesh, 
It's like with churches these days. You know, people think, you know, we're on the same team, but it's, there's always this fleshly competition that goes on, right? You know, just in the flesh. So this is what his disciples are thinking as well. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, so this you may remember when he baptized Jesus, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. So you see, like, they're in the flesh now and thinking, like, hey, you know that guy that was submitted to your ministry? You know how people are starting? They're not going to you anymore. Now they're starting to go to him. Now in the flesh, what's our reaction? You start thinking, like, oh, man, am I doing something wrong? Am I, you know, like, maybe I, you, there's this fleshly competition that starts, right? But how does John respond to Jesus being exalted and him being abased? John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Wow, what a humble spirit. How, how John the Baptist knew, like, hey, it's not even me that built this ministry. Like, why, why am I worried about who comes here and who goes there? He says, I don't even, I don't, the only reason why I even have this is because God gave it to me, right? A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. So notice the meekness and humility of John the Baptist, that he knew his position in life. He knew that God was here and he was here and not the other way around, putting yourself before God. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. See, we ought to be joyful not because we get what we want in life, but because that we are pleasing God in our life. That's the sort of attitude that John the Baptist had. He didn't have joy because he was accomplished. He had this great ministry. He was getting what he wanted out of life. It was, just was joyful that he got to serve the Lord Jesus and he was pleasing to the Lord Jesus, right? He's saying here, because in this analogy, he's the bride. Um, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom. So he realized he's just the mate of the bridegroom. And don't you see that happen in weddings? You know, like, like in weddings, it's the bride and the bridegroom's day. But you know when you see like bride, you see groomsmen and you see like bridesmaids especially, sometimes trying to overshadow the bride. You know, that's, that's that sort of mentality that John the Baptist didn't have, where it's the day is about somebody else, but then the bridal party is trying to outshow the bride and the groom and get, their, get all the attention. That's not what you ought to be like if you are ever part of a bridal party. You ought to be like John the Baptist and exalt the friend, the person who's the bride and the bridegroom, uh, and help them to have the best time of their life in terms of that day. So he uses that analogy. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. And one of the greatest things that John the Baptist has said, and ought to be really our you know a, a verse that we should all take to heart he must increase but i must decrease is this how you live your life do you think in my life do, am i just constantly increasing my own stature increasing my standing or is it about increasing the lord jesus christ what does my life do does my life increase me or does it increase the lord jesus well john the baptist had the right frame of mind he said you know what my time was just to to come before Jesus, now Jesus is here. Hey, I'm happy that He's here, and right, and I, my joy therefore is fulfilled. He knew His place, and He was humble. He must increase, but I must decrease. And we see John the Baptist now have to live this out. So it's easy to say things like this, right? It's easy to say when everything's going well, your ministry's flourishing, and he says, "Hey, I must. He must increase. I must decrease." But things are just still going well. Well, where we learn about John the Baptist in the next couple of chapters is he gets to be tested on this. Does he really, does he, can he really stand by this thing that he has that Jesus must increase and he must decrease? He is tested on this. Now in Matthew 4, this is Matthew 3. Uh, we just went through Matthew 3 before. In Matthew 4, it's interesting here that now Jesus in Matthew 4 starts his public ministry. Now, when it starts, look at what it says. It says, now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the borders of Zebulun and Nephthalim, 
that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light has sprung up. So this is Jesus now fulfilling an Old Testament prophecy that there is going to be light throughout the land. Because who's the light that John the Baptist, you know, John 1 says, He was not that true light, he was sent to bear witness of that light. Now Jesus starts his public preaching ministry. But what is interesting about Jesus' public ministry is it didn't start until John was cast into the prison. So isn't it interesting that John is like bearing witness of this light. Jesus has him, in a sense, I, you know, the, the, we see why he was cast into the prison. But John the Baptist, now that light is turned off. He's cast into prison. And this is when Jesus Christ comes out to start preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So interesting that transition there. And, you know, you learn about John the Baptist as you read through the Gospels. You often wonder, like, man, what happened to John the Baptist? Because, you know, it's this great ministry just started. And then we learn, um, you know, his ending, uh, which was not so, not so joyous. So now Jesus goes out and preaches. So it's just interesting that his ministry starts when John the Baptist is now thrown into prison. Now, why was John the Baptist thrown into prison? Well, we go to Luke 3 and we learn a bit about the things that John the Baptist preached. And this is why you need to understand that John the Baptist did not only preach a salvation message only. He preached righteous living as well. So this is another thing that we can emulate, right? So John the Baptist, he preached what was popular, what was not popular. You know, he preached the truth even when it got him into trouble. And we see here, this is the reason why he was cast into prison. Because he was not called to, he was not scared to call out the sin of the leaders in his days and to preach the word of God faithfully. Luke 3, uh, verse 10. The people asked him, saying, What shall we do? So I haven't read the whole chapter because the beginning of Luke chapter 3 is very sim similar to Matthew chapter 3, where he's talking about somebody coming after him and he's rebuking the Pharisees and the Sadducees and calling them a generation of vipers. Now the rest of the people listening to him, now we get a bit more insight into more of the preaching of John the Baptist. The people asked him, saying, hey, what shall we do? Right, because now he's told the religious leaders to like, don't just trust you know, your own uh, you know, your, your lineage to do these things. Now the people are asking him, hey, what, what are the sort of things we should do? Not what do we do to be saved, not just, just the things that we should do. He answereth and saith unto them, he that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none, and he that hath meat, let him do likewise. So what is he saying? We ought to be a generous people, right? If we have excessive things, then we ought to help those that need help. We should use our, use our resources to help others. Then came also the publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? So you see here that, see how John, see the, the gospel message it's the same to everybody, right? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. See, John the Baptist can't be preaching a salvation message to these people when they're coming to him because it's not like different for everybody else. You know, it's not like, you know, for you, you just have to give some charity. But you, you need to stop stealing from people. You, like, you know, make sure you do your job properly. Like, it's different things for people to get saved. Oh, that's not fair, right? If you have to, because people have different levels of difficulty. But salvation is fair because everybody has faith, right? God has given the measure of faith to every man. We all have faith. It's whether we put that faith in Jesus Christ. That's possible for everybody. But this is a different instruction. Why? Because he's just teaching people. Because John the Baptist's job was not only to point people to Jesus, but it was to get people right with God as well. So we see him doing both, preaching the word, preaching salvation. And he said unto them, so this is to the, the publicans. What are the publicans? They're the tax collectors, right? They're the people that work for the ATO, the people that can't be, they audit you. That's these guys, right? Making sure the government gets what uh, they are asking, what they're demanding for. And he said unto them, exact no more than that which is appointed you. Because what was happening when they were collecting money on the behalf of the government, they pocket a bit for themselves. It'd be harder to do now, right? It'd be harder to steal money from people that where you're collecting because it's all electronic now. Now you just audit people. But back in the day, they go and collect pieces of gold. And what they do, they'll tell, hey, the government actually needs more than that. And what they do, they pocket the excess. The soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, and what shall we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man. So how can we apply that today? It's like the people in authority, the executives, like the police and the soldiers, 
They're saying, hey, when you go and enforce laws and you're a soldier, hey, you do it the right way. You're not violent to people and just cause them harm, people that are innocent, like we see today. You know, you see everyone now trying to record the police in America. Why? Because police brutality was getting out of hand. They're doing what these soldiers are doing. They're just being violent with people because sometimes they get into those, that, 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 that force, that special force of the police because they want to rough people up. And when they don't get to rough people up, it kind of like, you know, makes them itch a bit, those sort of people. So it's good now that they're making all the police like wear body cams and whatnot, keeping them accountable so that they're not doing these things. And as a people, we're in expectation. And all men mused in their hearts of John. So he's saying, man, they're hearing this preaching from John. Well, they're saying all men mused in their hearts of John. What does it mean to muse in your heart? You're thinking about, man, man, who is this man? Right? Whether he were the Christ or not. So even though John the Baptist is saying, hey, I'm not the Christ, you know, and he's pointing them to somebody else, everyone's still thinking, man, is this guy the Christ? <laughs> even though he's saying they're not, he's not. John answered, saying unto them, oh, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather his wheat into the garner. But the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. So you see there, he's not even preaching just about holy living. See, he's preaching about end times as well, because one day he knows that Jesus is going to judge the quick and the dead. So you see how his preaching is not just limited to salvation. And when people depict John the Baptist that way, that's when they start thinking that he's just preaching work salvation because they're like, ah, John the Baptist preached repentance. Think about the things he would preach. Yeah, but he didn't only preach the baptism of repentance. He preached other things as well, like holy living. He preached about Jesus Christ. He preached about the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost from Jesus. And also here, he's preaching about end times as well, where Jesus will actually sit as a judge, right? Now, even though he's preaching all these things, John is not always aware that these are two different events. Because remember, in the Old Testament, they weren't, they didn't, weren't aware of the first coming and second coming. They, they, they didn't know these things. And that's why they got confused when Jesus came. They're like, man, is this the king? Why is he getting killed? Like, why is he not ruling and reigning and, and ushering in the kingdom? And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him, for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. So you see, not only was John the Baptist preaching the word of God faithfully, he called out Herod the king. Why? Because Herod the king took Philip's wife, his brother Philip's wife. So obviously Philip must have still been alive, right? Because otherwise... You, you know, so we don't know whether it's just that he took on a second wife and he shouldn't have, or whether his brother Philip, I believe his brother was still alive and he was committing adultery with his, with his brother's wife. So that's what John the Baptist was telling Herod off for. Now, who is Herodias? Herodias is the queen. So don't get confused between Herod and Herodias. Right? So Herodias is a woman's name. Herod is a male's name. So this is the king and queen. So Herodias was Philip's wife. And Herodias didn't like John the Baptist because John the Baptist was saying to Herod, it's not right for you to have Herodias because that's your brother's wife. Added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. So not killing John the Baptist. What he did is he put John the Baptist in prison for telling him off for that. Now we see in Matthew 11 a bit of insight into what John the Baptist was thinking while he was in prison right so we've seen here that john the baptist one of the things that made him so great is that he was preaching the word of god faithfully but even the greatest of men are men at best and here we see in matthew 11 the humanity obviously of john the baptist where he starts to doubt the lord jesus christ and this can be an encouragement to us because if john the baptist can be in a situation where he's doubting the lord jesus christ Man, consider us, you know, when, when sometimes we doubt the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't want that to discourage you. Stories like John the Baptist and, and Job are in here to encourage us that even the best of us, the men of most faith, can have down times. Know that you can get through this with the help of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when John had heard in the prison, so think about this. Jesus is out there 
doing miracles, doing great works. His public ministry has started. Now, where is John the Baptist throughout all this time? He's in prison, wasting away in prison. Imagine what's going through his mind. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. Why? Because he's hearing all these great things and he's thinking like, well, he's come to judge. You see how like, yeah, I think, I think this is the reason why John was a bit discouraged, right? Because they were confusing. Just like the disciples, when Jesus rose again from the dead, they're like, hey, when are you going to restore the kingdom? They were confused that Jesus' first coming was not to restore the kingdom, but to preach the gospel and to die for the sins of the world. So John's probably thinking the same. He's thinking like, man, I'm hearing all these things that Jesus is doing. Like, like are you, right? Because why am I, if, if he's ushering in the king, why am I a prophet of God in jail? <laughs> He's like, he heard the works of Christ. He sent two of his disciples and said unto him, look at what he says about Jesus. You can, this gives you some insight into how low he is. Because he says, art thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? Now this is the same man in John 1 that says this, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. So he acknowledged. Remember John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus? But here he's saying, no, he was before me. So he knew that he was God in the flesh that pre-existed him. And I knew him not but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. Just think back to the Mount Transfiguration, like where John, James and Peter, you know, saw Jesus glorified. John the Baptist also had a vision, right? When he baptized Jesus, he saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. It abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me the baptized with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Powerful preaching, powerful testimony. But when this man is thrown into jail, he hears all the things that Jesus is doing. And look at what he says. Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? So notice that even the greatest of men, he's broken here. Right, where he's starting to think, like, man, like I baptized him, like I saw the Spirit, but even he, in this point in his life, is starting to doubt the Lord Jesus Christ. So remember, John sent disciples to Jesus to ask these things because John is stuck in prison. Now Jesus answered and said unto them, Look at this, go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now don't you think John in prison is thinking, man, if I tell Jesus, Jesus, you, you kind of think at this time, like Jesus knows he's in prison. Don't you think John the Baptist would be thinking, why is Jesus letting me be in prison when he's out there healing people, doing all these great works, but here I am in the prison? You can start to understand why John the Baptist is starting to doubt the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, I'm sure mo most of us would as well in that situation. He's hearing all these things. And when he tells Jesus, he sends people to Jesus, not even a hint that Jesus even plans on taking him out of prison. Now think about Paul and Peter. When they were in prison, what happened? Miracles. Peter, bars open, he's taken out of prison. Paul singing, there's a miracle, the bars open, right? Remember the Philippian jailer? John the Baptist is in prison at this time, sends messages to Jesus. Jesus, it's like, 
He knows he's in prison. He doesn't do anything about it. Just goes and te- tells the disciples that John sent and just says, just go and remind John of the things that we're doing. Just tell him what you see. Now, this is what is interesting about John the Baptist. Is I wanted to show you here in John 20. What's interesting about John the Baptist is, remember, Jesus did not start his public ministry until John the Baptist was thrown into prison. So all these miracles that are happening, all the healing, all the great things that, the things that he's hearing, he didn't see them for himself. He's not seeing any of this, right? Because he's in prison. But what is he he's hearing about it? And that's why what I think, one thing as well that makes John the Baptist so great is he was given an opportunity to believe things about Jesus that he couldn't see. Right? Because a lot of people saw those mirrors. Look at what it says here in John 20. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Because what was Thomas's problem? He needed to see to believe. He's like, I'm not going to believe all this until I feel the hole in his side, I look at his hands. He got that opportunity, right? To see. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Look at this. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So is this one of the reasons why John the Baptist was so great? Because he was tested, right? He was tested, his humility was tested. He said, I must increase, uh, I must de- he must increase, I must decrease. All right? Let's put you in jail while all this is happening. All these great things are happening while Jesus is here. The light is the brightest. You're going to be in the darkest place. He starts doubting. And when he asks, this Jesus, do you come? What does Jesus say? He just sends people to go tell him this is what's happening. So he actually gets an opportunity to live that out and live out what we see here, that he just hears about these things. And hopefully, I would, I would think that when John heard that from Jesus, he had the right response. Right? He was doubting, but he had the right response. Why? Because when Jesus continues in Matthew 11, this is where we started this sermon. Why he was the greatest man that ever lived. Whosoever shall not be offended, blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. So I have the sneaking suspicion that when he got that message back from Jesus, it, it was enough for him and he believed and he was blessed. And as they departed, now you hear what Jesus has to say about John while he's in prison. Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? So now Jesus tells what he thinks about John. He says, when you went out to hear John's preaching, what did you expect to see? A reed shaken with the wind? What does that mean? Like you think of the grass waving wherever the wind blows. You think about Ephesians 4, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. He's saying, is that John the Baptist? Is that what you expect? Some weak man? Because because they're hearing about the doubt, right? And he's thinking, do you think that's what John is? Do you think he's just this reed shaking in the wind? No, he's going through some hard times. And I'm sure Jesus knows when he hears that news, he's not this reed shaking in the wind. You know, a reed shaken with the wind. But what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment, somebody who's just privileged, has it easy in life. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Right? See, John the Baptist, he lived in the desert, remember? Camel's hair, girt about eating locusts and wild honey. They that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. This is not what John the Baptist is. But, so he's a tough man. But when, what went you out for to see? A prophet? Yeah, you went out to see a prophet. That's who John the Baptist was. But look at what Jesus says. Yea, and I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. So he says he's one of the greatest, he is the greatest prophet that came before the Lord Jesus because he was the one that came right before the light. Verily I say unto you, and this is where we started, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, for, and if you will receive it, this is Elias which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So just reflect on John the Baptist's situation. 
He's in prison, right? He's starting to doubt. He's reminded. And man, blessed is those that believe and don't see. So try and apply that in your own life. Because sometimes you think to God, man, why is God letting me go through this? Why is God letting me go through uh, these hard times? But you know what? Sometimes, you know, in another passage, the disciples went... They, they went to Jesus and, and, and they, obviously Jesus knew that he was in prison. So, I'm um, sorry, I'm just getting it mixed up in my own head in a different passage I'm thinking of. But when you think in your own mind, why does God let me go through these hard times? You need to consider John the Baptist. You need to consider Job. You need to consider that people that have done greater and mightier things than yourself have gone through much harder times. Jesus knows what you're going through and he has a reason for it. And there was a reason as well for why John the Baptist went through these hard times. And is this the reason? I'm not too sure, but this is something that I think, you know, made him a great man and the greatest man that ever lived. Now, the last passage we want to go to is the death of John the Baptist, Mark 6. For Herod himself has sent forth and laid hold upon John. So if you remember, Herod cast John into prison. Why? Because he preached against Herod for um, he preached against Herod for taking his brother Philip's wife. Oh, I'll just turn the aircon on if you guys get a bit, I'm getting a bit hot in here. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. So you see how Herodias wanted to kill John the Baptist, but Herod didn't allow her to kill the John, ba John the Baptist. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced, and pleased Herod, and then that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. Now, I think when you see this in the Bible, because you see this in Esther as well, I think it's just a figure of speech that kings are just kind of being graceful and just saying, hey, just basically you can ask me for something. Because I think if you actually ask them for the half of their kingdom, they'd probably say no, right? So just, yeah, it's just a, I think it's just a euphemism for like, hey, I'm going to be generous you can ask me, but you just can't take the kingdom from me. You know, obviously, you just can't take my rule. What shall I ask? So, she, so what's happening here? So Herodias doesn't like John the Baptist trying to kill John the Baptist. And Herod's saying, no, no, I'm not going to let you kill him. Because he knew that he was a man of God. He was a prophet of God. So on his birthday, when he's celebrating his birthday, Herodias' daughter is dancing for him. And he makes a stupid oath and says, hey, whatever you ask, I'm going to give you. So she goes to her mother and says, well, what should I ask for? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes, which sat with him, he would not reject her. So you see how Herod made this silly oath because he didn't want to look bad in front of people that he made the oath in front of. He actually sends and get, gets John the Baptist executed in prison. And immediately the king sent an executioner, commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in the prison. And brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. In another chapter, and this is what I was thinking about before, in Matthew 14, it says, And his disciples came, took up the body, and buried it, and went and told Jesus. So Jesus was aware that John had lost his life over something as trivial, over a silly oath, over a birthday. So just think about John the Baptist's life. This is what I think is very profound about his life, right? And we're going to end it here. Is John the Baptist was the greatest man that ever lived, according to Jesus. He was the greatest prophet that ever lived. But John the Baptist, he didn't even do any miracles. I think about the prophets that have done miracles in the past, done great this and great that. When John the Baptist started this public ministry, he was quickly thrown into prison after it started, right? Because Jesus' ministry started. And then in prison, 
he starts to doubt the Lord Jesus. He doesn't get to see any of the miracles. He doesn't get to see any of the works of Christ. He just hears about them. We, I think, we think he believes him. And then look at the way John the Baptist dies. He dies over an oath made at a birthday party because King Herod was just being silly about what he promised to give Herodias' daughter. And that's the end of John the Baptist. But yet, this is the greatest man that ever lived, who was ever born among women. Now, why do I think, what, think about what made him great. He came. Obviously, you have to be saved to be, you know, to follow in his footsteps. His salvation. He acknowledged the Lord Jesus Christ. He preached the word of God faithfully. He lived blameless, right? He lived a way that was pleasing to God. He preached the word of God. He lived without fear. He submitted to the will of God, even when it was uncomfortable. He did the will of God, even when it got him in trouble. And he believed the things that he didn't see. He trusted in God's word. And he was proven to that in prison. Now, one thing I think about when I think of John the Baptist is why I think he's such a good example to us. It's because if you think about all the things he did, these are things that we can do. He's a prophet where we can actually follow in his footsteps. We can actually preach God's word. We can point people to Jesus. We can be bold in how we preach. And we don't see all the miracles that happen. And yet we have an opportunity to believe the Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope as you look at the life of John, not only does it remind you the things that we can do to follow in the footsteps of the greatest man, the greatest prophet that ever lived. But I hope you're encouraged by his testimony, that his life was not just a bed of roses, and yet he was able to be acknowledged by the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ knew all the things that he did. All right, I hope you learned something. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the story of John the Baptist. Um, such an encouragement, Lord. I just can't always imagine all the things that he went through how hard it must have been for him in that prison and um lord we just assume that he did the he did the right thing in that moment it was an opportunity for him to believe the things that he didn't see and uh, lord you commended him you told us that he was the greatest man that was born among women so help us lord to learn from his example learn from his life and help us to emulate that as best we can so thank you for your word lord um, we just pray that uh, people will take this lesson to heart and lord help us to emulate john the baptist we pray these things in jesus name amen